Good morning, Dr. Harvey. Good morning. Um, would you state your name for the record and spell it as yes, well, please? Certainly, Dr. Lynn Harvey, L Y N N H A R V E Y. Thank you. And Ms. Har Dr. Harvey, um, where are you currently employed and in what position? I'm with the North Carolina Department of Public Instruction, where I serve as the Chief School Nutrition Services. <coughs> okay. And before walking us through your slides and talking a little bit about what your section does, um, would you um, tell us about your educational and ex work experience background? Be happy to, thank you. Uh, my undergraduate degree in food and nutrition I came from Meredith College. My master's degree in nutrition science and food systems management from East Carolina University and my doctoral degree in education from North Carolina State University. I am a registered dietitian by the Commission on Dietetic Registration. I am licensed by the state of North Carolina as a registered licensed dietitian nutritionist, certified to practice as a health care provider. I'm a fellow of the American Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics and credentialed as a school nutrition specialist. Uh, my career has been quite an interesting one. I began as a clinical dietitian nutritionist where one of my specialties was uh, pediatric nutrition and served at Wake Medical Center. I have also served at the North Carolina State University's Cooperative Extension Service as an extension agent and an extension associate specialist in the area of food, nutrition, and human development. I served for 10 years as a on a part-time basis as a health team reporter for WRAL-TV and have had the privilege of working over five decades in the school nutrition program, first right out of college in the summer nutrition program in the late 70s, in the uh, uh, early, mid 80s, 90s as a nutrition education and continuing education professional with the department and for the last 12 years as the section chief. Okay, um, and I, I think that you've got a few slides to walk us through and I'm going to let you proceed. I do indeed, thank you. Uh, I'd like to begin by saying that we appreciate the opportunity to join the conversation because our section th thinks nutrition because we know that students can't think without it and that's the direction that drives our section in all of our decision making. We have the privilege of administering the federally assisted school nutrition programs which include the National School Lunch Program, providing school lunches during the instructional day, the School Breakfast Program which came along about 20 years after and provides nutritious breakfasts for students, the After School Snack Program that recognizes many students need a, need a nutritional boost before they head home at the end of the day, the Summer Nutrition Program, which provides meals for students during the summer months when school is not in session. The Special Milk Program that recognizes, again, summer camps and other institutions uh, have need for food beyond just the basic meal packages. The Fresh Fruit and Vegetable Program, which is one of the most exciting school nutrition programs available. It provides free fresh fruits and vegetables to uh, economically disadvantaged elementary schools. The intent is to help students develop a taste for fresh fruits and vegetables over less nutritious snacks like cookies or chips. And we administer the School Nutrition Leadership Academy, which is a partner with North Carolina State University's Office of <coughs> Professional and Continuing Education. In this venue, we provide continuous professional development for local school nutrition personnel, school nutrition administrators, and staff to help them achieve the, the most successful local school nutrition programs possible. And when you say school nutrition, you're talking about your section, which is housed at DPI. That's is that correct. correct. And how many staff members do you have? We have a staff of approximately 36, one third of whom are registered dietitians, licensed nutritionists. Our focus, again, is the nutritional health and well being of our students. Okay, thank you. We do have a highly qualified staff where we're responsible for the administrative and regulatory oversight of the school meals programs. These are, as mentioned previously, uh, federally assisted and very highly federally regulated, so it's our responsibility to make sure that the federal rules are implemented at the local level. We also provide continuous professional development and continuing education for school nutrition personnel, school business, finance, and other administrative personnel. We provide on-site technical assistance and consultation. In fact, the majority of our staff are not housed physically at DPI. Instead, they're housed throughout the state in the education regions. So they may have access to a local school within two hours. So if there is an issue that needs immediate attention, they can certainly be there. We do provide regular monitoring and compliance reviews. All total, these programs are worth about three quarters of a billion dollars in our state. And uh, we as uh, responsibilities for uh, our taxpayer dollars, we very closely monitor to ensure those funds are being used only as intended. 
But we do this uh, certainly as a section within the department with a collaboration of various stakeholders. We're very closely involved with our colleagues in the Department of Health and Human Services, Nutrition Services Branch. We work with the Economic Development Units. We work as well with the North Carolina Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services and various nonprofit organizations who also share a commitment to making certain that our, our students are adequately nourished. Our, yes, sir. It's largely from our federal partner through the U.S. Department of Agriculture. There are congressional appropriations uh, routinely. That money flows through the Department of Public Instruction. And then the local school districts are reimbursed for every qualifying meal served to students. Largely federal, yes. Our staff, uh, as mentioned previously, we have health care professionals, we have operations and management consultants, business and financial and data analysts, program and compliance specialists, and of course technology and development specialists. As uh, mentioned previously, this is how the program operates. It is largely federally assisted. Uh, a tremendous amount of our funds are federally appropriated. The, the uh, law itself enacted by Congress. The, Department of Jurisdiction at the federal level is the Department of Agriculture who stipulate our regulations. Those regulations and funds then flow through the State Education Agency and through the State Board of Education. They are then administered to the local education agency and local boards of education. Our local boards of education are ultimately responsible for the implementation and oversight of their school nutrition programs. We do work in partnership with them to ensure compliance with federal regulations. Uh, we have very impressive statistics about the school nutrition program in North Carolina. We are the seventh largest school nutrition program in the nation. Our school meals program are available to all students. I think there's the notion often that school meals programs are available only to economically disadvantaged students, but we, we much prefer to level the playing field to make certain that all students have access to nutritious, wholesome, appealing meals. 58% of our students qualify for free or reduced price meals, which means their households live at or near 185% or lower of poverty. Uh, what's in interesting about this particular st statistic, uh, I shared a moment ago that I've been in this position since 2012, excuse me, since 2003, and uh, since that time, we've seen an increase in the number of students who are economically disadvantaged from 43% to now 58%. And I find that personally to be a, a sobering statistic in a very short period of time. Uh, 1.5 million meals and snacks are served daily to our students. And uh, I'm proud to say that North Carolina's school nutrition program, both at the state and local levels, are recognized as among the finest in the nation. Uh, for quite some time, and certainly since their implementation in 1946, school meals programs have been intended to promote the health and well-being of all students, to help prevent childhood obesity, to provide a critical safety net to prevent child hunger, to promote the achievement and academic success of all students, and certainly those who are at risk for academic challenges, and to as well teach lifelong healthful eating habits. The program with which we are probably all most familiar is the school lunch program. It's been in existence since 1946. It's working quite well to achieve those goals we mentioned just a moment ago. School meals are the most nutritious choices available to students today, as they have been for many years. Research does indicate that school meals provide uh, seven times the amount of vegetables that most children receive in other venues, including their uh, meals packed from home, twice the amount of fruits that they would ordinarily consume, three times the amount of non-fat dairy, again a significant source of both protein and calcium, which as we know more about child health, these are critical nutrients of concern, five times the amount of whole grains that they might otherwise receive. School meals are low in sugar and, uh, and fat and higher in critical nutrients that we know to be essential in optimum brain activity. Now, Dr. Harvey, just for clarification, when you talk about the seven times the amount of vegetables in the this is the food that is served to all children That's in correct. public schools, not just the free and reduced lunch children. There's not a separate lunch line for those kids in terms of what is required to be served to all kids. That is correct. In fact, the law strictly prohibits the overt identification of any child who is eligible for free or reduced price meal benefits. So yes, school meals are open to all students and all are treated equally 
regardless of their ability or inability to pay. Yes, you no longer serve the chess pie of that school. Unfortunately, your chess pie went away with my snickerdoodle cookies. Yes, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> it was good, though. It was very good. But well, there's, there's still a place for those kinds of products. Available. And we're working to reformulate. That's something that we do in our section. We know that we like the good taste of food. So we're constantly working with our health team to refine, reformulate those products. Now, granted, they don't taste quite the same as they used to, but they're a good substitute. Just good for a <laughs> Good for a nap, right? Good. Yes. Research does indicate that having a wholesome, nutritious diet improves students' brain activity, maximizes their cognitive abilities, and ultimately improves their academic performance. Conversely, a non-nutritious diet in, uh, decreases the academic performance by limiting the amount of information that can go to the brain and limits, as we'll see in just a moment, the synaptic relationship as brains are firing trans neurotransmitters one to the other. So what is that specific connection between school meals and learning? Nutrients act as triggers. They stimulate the neurotransmitters in our brains, and as those neurotransmitters fire back and forth, we achieve our ability for optimum brain function. Those neurotransmitters ultimately direct our critical thinking, our ability to analyze, evaluate, synthesize, and issue judgment about the information that is processed in our brains. The absence of those essential nutrients, like vitamins, minerals, some of the micronutrients, and the macronutrients, like protein, carbohydrate, and fat, ultimately impairs our students' ability, or our ability, to learn. Now, of course, the older those brains get, uh, the, the, the more nu nutrient-dense our diets continue to be, <coughs> need to be, so as to maintain those critical junctions. School meals do indeed provide essential nutrients for optimum success. Um, Dr. Harvey, let me just stop you right there. Now, obviously, the USDA and the State Board of Education and the department and your section need to be commended for providing the opportunity for children to access these healthy meals every day. Can you thank force you. a child to eat in our public schools? Absolutely not. Okay, thank you. All you can do is put it there for the child to access. Exactly. Is that In fact, correct? science suggests that forcing a child to consume a food he or she does not like or does not intend to eat can ultimately be detrimental to the child. So we would never force. We want to encourage, teach, promote, but we cannot force. And so regardless of how much food is put before a child and how healthy that food is, that child may still have nutritional deficits that we just have no control over. Is yes, that they may, and it knows no socioeconomic spectrum. Thank you. We are extremely concerned about what we consider to be a crisis in our state, and that is a crisis around child hunger. Nearly 60% of students enrolled in our public schools are from economically disadvantaged households. While that is a, a struggling, a challenging statistic in itself, if we look at the national average related to child hunger, we see that nationally 22% of all students come from food insecure households. These are households in which the supply of food is inadequate in any given week, and as a result, children experience significant and often chronic hunger. While that statistic is problematic, 22% nationally, 27% is shameful in North Carolina, as 27% of our students in public schools struggle with hunger, many on a daily basis, weekly, monthly basis. Just no good excuse for that, unfortunately. Academically, students who experience hunger have limited attention spans. They are consumed by, where is my next meal coming from? Where is any source of food coming from? They ultimately exhibit behavioral problems. They're not able to focus. They're not able to drill into the concept that is being taught at, the, at any given time or to the academic experience. They have difficulty concentrating and performing complex tasks. They do have reduced cognition and brain function. They're, they're just simply not enough of the essential nutrients to create the neurotransmitters we described earlier. And as a result, they score lower on standardized tests, and they are much more likely to have to repeat a grade. 
We do know that hunger has a long-lasting and devastating impact on the health and development of children. This is especially true in the formative years and, and, and when there is cell or, or tissue formation. For example, we know the devastating impact of, of poor prenatal care on the developing fetus. We know that in very early childhood, nutrition is critical. The same uh, occurs in adolescence, that it's, it's essential for optimum brain to fun function for students to have the nutrients they need for success. I, I chose as just a, a conceptual model for why I think this is such an important consideration in our discussion about providing all students with a, a sound basic education, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, something I'm confident you're very familiar with. The premise of the hierarchy is that as, um, as individuals, we must achieve those needs at the lower levels before we can fully move toward the higher levels. We have to achieve our physiological needs for food, for water, our safety needs, for, for shelter, for clothing, uh, before we can expect to achieve the need to belong to a specific group and certainly before we can see the need to be concerned about us, our self-esteem and self-actualization. So the premise is that before students can be as successful academically as we all want them to be, we have to make sure that certainly their nutrition needs are met as a forerunner to that. A recent national study of educators published by Share Our Strength focusing on hunger in our schools. This is a representative sample of principals, teachers, and school support personnel. Suggests that every day teachers, principals, staff see students who simply cannot succeed because they are consumed by hunger. Uh, in the survey, 84% of principals say students are coming to school hungry because they do not have enough food at home to eat. It's, it's easy for us to think that, well, this is, this is perhaps uh, from parental ne neglect. But as we look closer, we discover that's simply not the case. There's simply not enough um, resources in the household to take care of the increasing needs for food, shelter, clothing, transportation, um, fuel, any other of uh, the priority needs to help the household maintain itself. 76% uh, of educators say, say their students regularly come to school hungry. It is not uncommon to find teachers with snack drawers. Students know where the snacks are, so that we've had no food. They know they can come to the drawer, they can get something. And we're, we're proud to see that our teachers are recognizing that it's not just something in the drawer that makes a difference, it's the nutritional quality of what they will have in the drawer that makes the difference. 59% uh, of educators say that a lot or most of the children in their schools rely on school meals as a primary source of nutrition. And that's something we're beginning to see in this state. Where at one time, perhaps school meals were considered a convenience for the household. Let's make sure that meals are available so that um, working moms and dads may not have to prepare or pack a lunch. But now we discover that these are critical resources, especially to our limited resource households. Continuing with the results of the survey, educators tell us that when students come to class hungry, they don't concentrate, they lack energy, they're lethargic, they're easily distracted, their academic performance suffers, they exhibit behavior problems, and that, those behavior problems are reflected in the distraction of eight other students around them. So while many think that it's just the hungry style the child that is distracted by the hunger, that hungry child will in turn distract eight other students in the classroom. So the hunger issue becomes an entire classroom issue and ultimately a community issue as well. These students also experience more illnesses and are absent from school more frequently. Um, Dr. Harvey, just for clarification, these studies that you yes. just um, indicated that you relied on with statistics, they're national studies? Yes, they are national studies. Okay, thank you. They're national studies. We see the same frequency of occurrence in North Carolina. School breakfast has become what we call a solution that works. We, we, we have a healthy participation in the school meals program of approximately 60%, meaning 60% of our students who attend public schools actually consume their meals, uh, their lunches, if you will, in the school nutrition program. But our participation in the school breakfast program, for a variety of factors, has been somewhat lower. Recently, we've discovered that uh, offering school breakfast to all students improves all their performance, especially in the areas of math and reading, memory and cognition, problem-solving skills, and other outcomes as measured on standardized tests. 
We also, I think, should consider that children who eat breakfast at school or closer to class test taking or complex skill evolution uh, times are better prepared to perform proficiently in those skills than when children eat breakfast really early at home. So you'll see in just a moment some very innovative approaches we have to make sure that all students have access to a nutritious breakfast. In 2011, our State Board of Education took the national lead on issuing a resolution that indicates that the school breakfast consumption may be counted as part of the instructional day as long as students are engaged in an age or developmentally appropriate instructional activity. This opened the door for us to make sure that students have access to breakfast who might not otherwise have had that access. For example, for decades, when the school bus was late, as school buses will inevitably be, a child had to walk past the school cafeteria, past the only opportunity for breakfast that she, he or she had to go to the classroom because to be late was unacceptable. Now we bring breakfast into the classroom for students so they can eat their meal together while they're participating in an academically appropriate uh, experience. We have grab and go breakfast for those students who are so hungry when they get off the school bus, they grab a, a, a breakfast at the back door, take it into their classroom or another environment, and consume the meal there. One of my favorites, I relate to this one, is the second chance breakfast. Not all of our adolescents are ready for breakfast at 6 a.m., but they're famished by 9.30. So second chance breakfast offers meals literally in the, in the corridors of the hallways of the school. Those uh, adolescents can grab the bag, take it back to their classroom, and as they begin their geometry or history uh, or social studies, they can enjoy the meal while they're studying. We also see universal school breakfast. Many of our districts have recognized the academic impact of breakfast. One of our largest districts, for example, Charlotte Mecklenburg Schools, offers universal free breakfast to all students so that uh, everyone has access and the ability to pay for those meals is, is no longer an issue. Do you, have you seen any instances, Dr. Harvey, where local school systems have tapped into local um, restaurants or other food suppliers to help with things like universal breakfast? Yes, we have. We've seen uh, where businesses, uh, uh, community support networks recognize as well that students can't achieve their best without breakfast, so they will contribute funds to the local uh, education agency for these purposes. What we've discovered is that once people become aware that we have hungry children in our, literally in our back doors, they are quite willing to exercise and to find the resources needed to make sure that no child goes without a meal. We've been very encouraged by that. Thank you. Uh, we, uh, in looking at the uh, another recent study, a social impact analysis by the Deloitte uh, group, we find that if we uh, if we engage our students as frequently in school breakfast as we do in school lunch, the potential impact, and this is specifically for North Carolina, 129,000 additional days of school attendance per year. 86,000 students scoring higher on standardized tests per year and more than 21,000 additional students could graduate from high school. And we do know, we, we then formed the linkage that school breakfast, while in and of itself is not the direct link to graduation, it is a critical component to supporting the academic progress in the school in order to ultimately achieve graduation. And Dr. Harvey, what are the impediments to more schools being able to provide these breakfasts? You've indicated mm -hmm. that school systems can go out and get community help. Yes. What are some of the impediments out there to schools doing this? My observation the past few years has, has been, number one, is the awareness. We often, many of us come from such an economically well-insulated environment that we don't recognize child hunger, but it is on every street corner, it's in every community, and it is vastly prevalent in many of our um, economically challenged communities. We have to ourselves recognize it, which means that our, our school administrators have to recognize it. Our, our local boards of education, our local county commissioners, our local uh, advocacy groups have to recognize that we do have a crisis of child hunger in our state. And is, your, is that part of your section's mission or job, is to get that word out there? Yes, it is. Now, once we have this awareness, funding becomes less of a problem for us because these funds are appropriated at the federal level. Once we have the mechanism and we, and we create those mechanisms locally to offer the meal to students, federal funds are available on a reimbursement basis. So 
the funds are available and sadly we leave millions of dollars on the table annually because we we don't have the awareness at this point that this is a critical issue we all must be involved in solving. So you're saying that resources in the form of money yes. is not an object to accomplishing what this slide says we can do. That's correct. We have federal funds appropriated in the state of North Carolina in order to reimburse local boards of education for all meals served to students. And so, why, why is, once you got the money, then I think again it becomes a, a matter of awareness. We are not aware that children are experiencing such extreme hunger in our state. We see, we think of hunger and we think of something that might happen in a third world where we see a child who's em emaciated. We see children coming to school who look healthy. And in fact, we see more students who are on the plump side, if you will. But that obesity, that plumpness that's is an the, indicator. That's even what that should be. That's, that's exactly right. Candy, mm -hmm. soft drinks, it is. And that's part of the equation. The other part, we have such a paradox between uh, obesity, whether it's in children or adults, and economics. Typically, people will try to make their dollar stretch, and the least expensive foods available to households are often the least nutritious foods, and therein lies a part of our problem as well. So again, helping all of our teachers, our principals, our school boards, our superintendents, our community leaders have a vested interest in making sure that students are well nourished, helps us make sure those breakfast programs are available to students. I, I, I have gotten to the end of the question. world is out there that this is a problem. And you've already got the cafeteria set up anyway. Then why don't all LEAs have the breakfast program as well as they all they all have to have a school lunch. So and it's federal money, so without naming names, who's not doing it? Well I, I thank you for clarifying the question. All of our school districts do offer a breakfast program. Our challenge becomes in the traditional cafeteria, again if the school bus is late or if the carpool line is late, it becomes an issue of access. So we're working diligently to overcome those issues of access by taking meals to students, like the meals in the classroom. So we're seeing more and more of that. I think it takes a little time for our education infrastructure to adjust to the fact that the meal is no longer in the cafeteria. The meal may be providing in the, provided in the parking lot or it may be provided on a school bus or it may be provided elsewhere. And it takes time, uh, perhaps for the word to spread from one district to another, hey, this really works. And we know that when our children have nutritious breakfast, they're going to be more ready to learn, more well engaged in the classroom. So it's a problem we're working on solving, one county at a time. Make sure that some of these out there that just simply weren't doing it. They're doing it. They're doing it. Everybody's doing it. All right. Yes, sir. We have to worry about it. Expanding for those in need. Yes, we do. That's correct. As we begin to share information like this, I think we can convince our local decision makers, county commissioners, boards of education, that breakfast can make a difference. For example, from the Deloitte study, we see that children who participate in breakfast are present one and a half more days per year than those who don't have an innovative school breakfast. This is the breakfast in the classroom we described, or the grab and go breakfast. They score 17 and a half percent higher on standardized mathematics scores. They are 20 percent more likely to graduate from high school. Kids who eat breakfast, who reap the benefits, are, uh, upon graduation, going to earn $10,000 annually, more than those who do not, and they're more likely to break that cycle of hunger as adults. And again, it all goes back to something as simple as providing breakfast at school. We often talk about the challenges of children who live in poverty, and while I think we'll all agree that resolving poverty is a complex issue, feeding the child is a very simple thing that we can do. 
We are also very concerned about working with students with have, that have special nutrition needs. As Ms. Menard mentioned a moment ago, we have many students in North Carolina that do require special dietary modifications in order to manage a disease or disability. Many come to school with life-threatening food allergies, food intolerances, or diabetes. They require texture modifications because of a chronic and debilitating health condition. We work very closely to make sure that those needs are met in a manner that reflects each individual's child's need. In addition to the school breakfast and lunch programs, we also provide after-school snacks for many students who need uh, a nutritional boost before they go home at the end of the day. Uh, it, it's, it deeply saddens me to say that we do have many children in our public schools. Once they return home at the end of the day, what their last meal was, lunch or snack, is probably the last they'll have before they return to school the next day. So we want to equip as many students as possible with a snack. What's equally sad is to watch these students who will grab a prepackaged item and tuck it into their backpacks. You know they're very hungry, but they also live in a world where the siblings at home have very little food. So older brothers and sisters are very conscientious to take those foods home to their uh, siblings. The good thing about the after school snack program is that it must be accompanied by an educational or enrichment activity. So we see many opportunities for physical activity and movement. We see lots of activities as well for reading and supplemental education services at the end of the day. We do have an important program in North Carolina that allows many impoverished districts to offer a supper meal to our students. So essentially, uh, our, st our students in high poverty communities have access to breakfast, lunch, and dinner at school, simply because the resources are seldom available in the homes to make those meals available. We're excited to see a new federal law that has created a, a new provision called the Community Eligibility Provision. If you've uh, heard much about the school lunch program, you know that it's often based upon a household application. The household must demonstrate their economic need for free or reduced price meals. But the community eligibility provision looks at states like ours relative to pockets of poverty. And in these pockets of poverty, in which one single school may reside, if the poverty level is high enough, then all students enrolled in that high poverty school are uh, eligible for meals and snacks at no cost to the student. We are very pleased about that because in the first year of implementation we saw over 650 North Carolina schools engage in the community eligibility provision. It was a new program. It affected the way we allocate our Title I money locally, so we suspect that there may be some reluctance to adopt this program early on. We're quite pleased to see a very robust response, especially in a state with 27% of students um, at risk for hunger. But the community eligibility program reduces the administrative burden to the household. There's no longer a need for an application. Students are eligible to participate based upon their enrollment in another uh, means-tested nutrition program like the food stamp or SNAP program. Uh, this program also identifies students who are homeless, migratory, runaway, foster children. Even in preschool, Head Start students are eligible to participate at, uh, in this program. Again, all meals, snacks at no cost. Perhaps the best thing that's come from CEP is that we have begun to remove the stigma from the cafeteria. All students can go into the cafeteria and receive their meal at no charge. There's not a distinction between children who can pay for their meals and those who can't. Uh, we say often that the, the walk to the school cafeteria should never be a walk of shame. But we've noticed in this environment in which uh, children do notice the socioeconomic advantages that one student may have over another, that that walk has all too often become a walk of shame. And there are many hungry children who would still rather preserve their self-esteem than to ask for a meal at no charge. This provision prevents that from occurring, so it's very exciting to see. And along those lines, isn't... No, go ahead. For years, it's always been a standard that when you ask the children to get to middle school, especially mm -hmm. high school, you will see the FRL numbers drop, the senior drop, because they are embarrassed to, to, to accept the, the free lunch. You're this correct. is helping this is helping move that stage because you look at the high school, 
data will be 60% free and reduced lunch. In elementary schools, the community will be 80 to 95. But this is because the children know who's, still, who's taking advantage of it and who's not. That's correct. So this helps tremendously. It does. And that's encouraging because we now see a, a greater willingness for those hungry students to accept the meal that's available to them. Everyone is, is treated equitably. That was the point that I was going to have her make, Your Honor. Thank Everyone you for the same Absolutely. So, so ultimately, uh, if, if you're creating that wish list, ideally we'd see a universal free meal program for all students so we don't ever have to worry about that issue of uh, a child's ability or inability to pay. We do ask that of our uh, congressional delegation quite frequently. Let's move forward and make this available to all students just as we do transportation or textbooks. In addition to breakfast, lunch, snacks, we've now discovered that uh, student hunger does not take a break just because school is out. In another recent study published by Deloitte, uh, summer is uh, especially a, a, a difficult time for children who normally receive the free and reduced price lunches at school and now they're face facing bare pantries at home. So the summer nutrition programs ensure that our low income areas provide nutritious meals in the communities uh, when school is out. It, just last year, as we recognized that we have too many hungry children during the summer, only 17% of students who are eligible for free or reduced price meals at school were participating in the summer nutrition programs. We petitioned the General Assembly uh, to move the summer nutrition program from the Department of Health and Human Services into DPI because we felt that we could use our existing local infrastructure. Uh, there are school cafeterias in, in every school and state where we could prepare these meals and work with our community partners like the Boys and Girls Clubs, like the local faith-based communities to deliver meals to students, to make them available. Uh, so we're seeing a, a, a greater increase in the number of summer meals available to our students. And last year, as a matter of fact, when we heard about what I call the third grade reading camps initiative, we moved very quickly in advance of that uh, uh, initiative to locate schools in every district where if the third grade reading camp was held in that particular site, all students would receive meals at no cost. So everyone came, they read, they engaged, they received a breakfast or lunch or both, whatever it was felt that was the need was in that community. So we're very excited to be a partner in that initiative. A summer hunger is too expensive to ignore, not just because of the health and well-being of children, but we see something known as the summer slip. When children are out of the classroom, they're not eating as nutritiously, it is not unusual to see their cognitive skills begin to decline. They're watching way too much television, obviously, or just doing very little. And where we see this having the greatest effect is by the end of the fifth grade, low-income youth are nearly three grade equivalents behind their more affluent peers. So it is critical that we catch these students early on, uh, pre-K, uh, kindergarten, first, second, third grades, and make certain that they're receiving meals at school as well as during the summer months. So as I conclude, I, I would reiterate the message that I have uh, shared all along. Our greatest barrier is the lack of awareness that we do indeed have a crisis of hunger in our state and that crisis of hunger is impacting adversely the health, well-being, and ultimately academic and future success of all of our students. We, it's something we can do, do something about. Um, Dr. Harvey, just a couple of things for the record. Um, thank you very much. This was My very pleasure. informative. Um, you've had, got several studies in here that um, are attributable to Deloitte. Yes. Is that how you pronounce that? That's correct. What is that organization? Uh, you perhaps have heard of Deloitte as an accounting and legal firm. This is their philanthropic arm and they're looking at creating social analysis surveys based upon existing data to look at how those trends in the data impact us as a nation, as a state, and as individual communities. Um, thank you. And with regard to the awareness component of this, is there any LEA in this state that your section has not reached out to with this information? We reach out to every LEA. In fact, we reach out to any provider 
of education services to students. So we're not just in school districts. We're in residential child care facilities. We're in juvenile justice facilities. Any place where a child comes and then during that period of time, whether they're there voluntarily or involuntarily, there is an opportunity for us to nourish their bodies and their minds. We are, we're there. They may participate in the program. Including pre-K? Pre-K, absolutely. Okay, we feed you. infants in this program where the intent is for us to do so. For example, if an infant comes to school with a teen mom, we're obliged to help take care of the mom as well as the infant. Thank you very much. My pleasure. I have a few questions, Then we'll take the Thank you. Good morning, Dr. Harvey. Good morning. I'm Melanie Dubas, counsel for the plaintiffs in the case. I just have a couple of follow-up questions. Sure. Um, I believe you testified in response to both Ms. Crumpler's questions <coughs> and perhaps uh, Judge Manning's questions that the school nutrition program is largely federal dollars. Are there any state dollars involved in the program? There is a state revenue match requirement. The state is required to invest a specific amount of money in order to draw down the federal funds. There's also a source of local funding, approximately half of the three quarters of a billion that I mentioned earlier is available in local funds. Uh, so half of the three quarters of a billion dollars is... Comes is from local funds. Local funds. Yes. Okay. Um, and the other half of that is federal funding? That's correct. Um, and then what percentage of the, the program is the state uh, revenue match? Approximately one and a half percent. And you mentioned that in response to Judge Manning's questions about the, the breakfast program, universal breakfast, that any uh, that federal dollars are available for any reimbursable meal. So is that a is that federal grant uh, a reimbursable grant? In other words, the schools spend the money up front and then they can submit to have that reimbursed. That's correct. It, it's actually an entitlement. So the program is congressionally reauthorized every five years. And annually, the reimbursement rates increase to reflect the, the cost of meals and the cost of staffing in the school cafeterias. And, and Dr. Harvey, just based on some personal experience about yes. how uh, uh, reimbursable funding works, mm -hmm. um, in, have you ever observed that, that cash flow is a, 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 an issue in being able to access those, those federal funds. In other words, if an organization, or in this case an LEA, doesn't have cash on hand to outlay up front, then, then there's, there's no outlay in, that can be reimbursed by the feds. Is that, you, do you observe that in the child nutrition program? We don't observe that because we, we require our districts to report to us almost immediately after the month so that when, when the meals are served and tabulated, they file their claim for reimbursement within the first three days of the month, and we try to have them all reimbursed by the tenth of the month. That doesn't always work that way, but that's our goal. I can assure you it does not always work that way with a lot of other grants. <laughs> and I understand. And I think perhaps the, the nature of the entitlement Yes. Uh, ensures that that funding is going to be available when the districts draw it down. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. Sorry. And um, then in talking about um, uh, nutrition available, you talked about the after-school snacks. Um, if the school day, if the school day is expanded in a particular district or in a particular mm -hmm. low-performing school, so that at-risk students can have more learning time. Are there federal dollars available to provide a, a dinner meal or an evening meal in those instances? There are in those low poverty areas, okay. yes. So those low poverty areas... Excuse me, high poverty areas, I should say, in those high poverty areas. Right. Uh, high poverty, often low performing yes. areas. If those low, uh, low performing districts and, and areas are able then to figure out how to transport the children and how to hire the teachers. The, the uh, nutrition part of it could be taken care of with federal dollars. Is that fair? That's correct. And on the uh, summer slip that you just testified mm -hmm. to, um, Dr. Harvey, were you here when Dr. Harrison testified two days ago? I was. You heard Dr. Harrison's testimony then about year-round school and how that can be um, a, a methodology to alleviate that summer slip, so to mm -hmm. speak. Um, and again, would federal funding be available to provide nutrition in a year-round model to help alleviate that summer slip, as you call it? Yes, it would be available. In fact, we do have year-round schools that participate in the National School Lunch Program year-round. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. No more questions, Your Honor. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you.